All right, Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus 11. We want to remind us as we jump in. uh, In Psalm 19, uh, we read that the heavens declare the glory of the Lord and and that the firmament shows forth his handiwork. Uh, Then, uh, right after that, then we read that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And we realize that Psalm 19 talks about two revelations of God. One, the revelation of God in nature, which is glorious and magnificent and constant. But then secondly, the revelation of God in his word, uh, which indeed converts the soul and, and, we are in, and reveals our hearts. And so tonight, as we, as we look at Leviticus chapter 11, uh, we have to realize that God, by his Holy Spirit, placed uh, this passage of scripture in the, the Bible for us. And what we also find within this passage of scripture is something marvelous and amazing about the character and nature of our God. It, it is, it's easy to come uh, to, uh, the Levitic, or to the dietary laws in Leviticus simply with uh, boxing gloves on, a defense mechanism, especially if you've ever uh, maybe known somebody that, that is a, uh, uh, a Messianic Jew or maybe um, uh, uh, even one step further where they're almost pulling away from Christ and, and, and trying to pull the, the, the New Testament church back under the dietary laws or many other Old Testament laws. Uh, it's, sometimes it's easy to, to poke fun at the dietary laws. Sometimes it's just our simple love of bacon alone that makes us think like, hey, that, that, that was a crazy time, you know, and we're, we're not living in those days anymore. Hallelujah. But we have to realize that when we study these uh, Levitical laws uh, that are these, and all of the Levitical laws, but especially the dietary laws here, that there is something marvelous about our God that is seen. And what that is, is that our God is holy. And he calls us to be holy. And so so the way that uh, these dietary laws are set up uh, here, uh, the Lord saves his commentary for the end of the chapter. And so I'm going to save my commentary for the end of the chapter. And then we'll look at chapter 12 in conclusion and then share uh, in communion. But first, let's just consider the nuts and bolts of the animals that could be eaten and the animals that were not eaten. And let's just place ourselves in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Mount Sinai 3,500 years ago, so we're 14, at this point, 1445 BC, or you know, still 1446 BC, somewhere right in that, that window when the children of Israel are receiving these dietary laws. And for 1,500 years, God's people would keep these laws as unto him, and it would be his will that they would do so. So I just want to say that just to kind of redeem these dietary laws a little bit, realizing that a holy God in a holy place of heaven gave these laws to his people so that they would walk obediently to them and that they would know him more thoroughly through them. God has no problem with these dietary laws. And he's, he's get, Jason, you're probably feeling very uncomfortable right there. Right? <laughs> I said, don't worry about it. I had, this was my introduction before he even said that. Okay, all right. <laughs> so uh, God, is, God has a wonderful uh, heart revelation for us in this passage. And, uh, and ultimately that, this, that he is, he's a holy God uh, to be approached by a holy people. Uh, we begin in verse 1. Let's just, let's just look at the nuts and bolts of this chapter here. I'll try to do this quickly, okay? Let's look at the first verse of Hebrews, I'm sorry, Leviticus chapter 11. Uh, It says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them. Uh, Now verse 1 there where it says, The Lord spoke to Moses. We're reminded that that God is speaking to Moses uh, and giving him the law. And this begins a string of 15 consecutive chapters in the book of Leviticus that begin with the phrase, now the Lord spoke. We, we certainly understand that this passage is divine in origin and that the law is good and holy and just and right. Okay, so this is God speaking his holy will, his holy law for his holy people in the wilderness years. Verse 2, speak to the children of Israel saying, these are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. 
Among the, among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, you may eat. So in verses 3 and 4, we begin with a positive command. Before the Lord gives the dietary restrictions, first off, he, he just says the words, you may eat. Now, I like those words a, a whole lot. Uh, the Lord says, these are the foods you may eat. And he doesn't go through and list all the foods you may eat. He just qualifies them into two things. The, of the clean animals, the, this would de designates a clean animal. It has cloven hooves and it chews the cud. A list of clean animals are actually listed uh, more so in, Deut in Deuteronomy's list. Uh, the primary ones, of course, sheep and, and goats and, and, um, and deer and gazelle and antelope. And those were, those were the primary animals that, that were eaten and healthy for you and good, and good for you and, 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 uh, and fish in the sea uh, and, and so many of these things. Uh, even the... The grasshopper, a clean animal. Can I get an amen? Uh, praise the Lord for that. So these were some of the clean animals that were given. Uh, but the Lord first just says, you may eat. And I just want to stop it one more second and think about this. The Lord is the one who has created the stomach, the tongue, the taste buds, the human appetite. The Lord delights to feed people. Uh, the Lord celebrates feasts throughout Scripture, people gathering together and eating. Some of your fondest memories, I know, have been around a table and eating food, and, and we go on dates with our loved ones, and we, we eat and we share in festive times. And, and the Scripture says and when we're in heaven, we're going to sit down at tables with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so the Lord is not anti-food. The Lord is not anti-celebration. The Lord is not anti-enjoyment. In fact, uh, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever and to enjoy all His benefits. Uh, the Lord gave all of the trees in the Garden of Eden. There's only one tree that they were not to eat of. Uh, but certainly, let's not think of God as an, an anti-celebration or an anti-food God. Uh, so the Lord says, all of these things you may eat, but these are the things you are not to eat. Verse 5. Uh, or verse, verse 4, actually. Uh, Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or those who have cloven hooves. So you can't eat the camel because it chews the cud and does not have cloven hooves. Uh, it's unclean to you. And notice how note it says this very same rhythm he's going to give. You shall not eat this because it doesn't meet one of the qualifications. And then this, this phrase, it is unclean to you. And then the rock hyrax, or that would be a badger, uh, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, it is unclean to you. Or the hare, that's the rabbit, because it chews the cud. Although it doesn't technically chew the cud, the, the cud. you've all seen a rabbit chewing, and it seems like he's chewing so thoroughly, he's chewing the cud, but, but, uh, but not scientifically. Because it chews the cud, but does not have uncloven, but does not have uh, cloven hooves, is unclean to you. Then ver, or, or, and then um, verse, verse 7, uh, the swine, though it divides the hoof, this is everybody's... Uh, uh, Problem, uh, the pig, we, you know, the pork is loved. Uh, and the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, it is unclean to you. The flesh you shall not eat, uh, shall not eat. their carcasses you shall not touch, these are unclean to you. And so the first thing that we see, uh, there's a series of animals, these are land animals that are given, and, and they, they, uh, the, the saying is they are unclean. Uh, the word unclean means the one that would defile, make ceremonially unclean, uh, one that would distance somebody from holy worship. And so hear what a holy God is saying to his holy people in the desert. He says, if you eat these animals, they are going to distance me from you. You are going, they, these are animals that are unclean and are not to be eaten. They are going to defile you. Then in verse 9, uh, these you may eat of the water. So we move from the land animals to the water animals. Uh, whatever is in the water and has fins and scales, whatever is in the seas or the rivers, you may eat. So if it swims, you can eat it. But, verse 10, but in all the seas or in the, the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water of every li living thing, th these, are, uh, these are your bottom feeders and the shrimp and, and all of these things that, again, many like. But, uh, but notice this phrase, they are an abomination to you. Notice right there at the end of verse 11. So now we've moved from the word unclean to the word abomination. They are an abomination. That word abomination may even be translated in the version you have, detestable. Uh, so this is something that's forbidden 
skin, it's detestable, um, something that would uh, repulse or turn away. Uh, and so the Lord says, these are things that should repulse you. You turn away from them, and I don't want you eating them. And then this word is repeated several times. Verse 11, they are an abomination to you. You shall not eat the flesh, but you shall regard their carcasses as an abomination. Uh, whatever is in the water that does not have fins and scales, they are an abomination to you, or they should be detestable to you. Um, and then he moves from the water now uh, into the air, so land, water, air. Uh, verse 13, now about the birds. And uh, you shall regard as an abomination of the birds. Uh, these shall not be eaten. Instead of giving categories, he just names them here. Uh, these are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite, the falcon after its kind, every raven after its kind, the ostrich, the short-eared owl, the seagull, the hawk after its kind, the little owl, the fisher owl, the screech owl, the white owl, pretty much all owls, uh, the jackdaw, and uh, the carrion vulture, the stork, or you can't eat a stork, the heron of its kind, the hoopoe, and or a bat. I'm sorry, you can't eat bats. Um, and so he gives all of those. And now we're on to insects, um, and they're not completely forbidden, but all flying insects that creep on all fours, verse 20, shall be an abomination to you. Yet uh, these you may eat of every flying insect that creeps on all fours, on all fours, sorry, uh, those which have joined legs above their feet with which to leap on the earth. So we, this is where we get our big hallelujah, because all, you know, all those insects that have big long uh, legs that can leap, uh, like the locust after its kind, or the destroying locust after its kind, the cricket after its kind, the chocolate-covered grasshopper after its kind, uh, all of these you may eat. Uh, verse 23, but, uh, but all other flying insects which have four feet shall be an abomination to you. And so what we find are two primary words that are used of these animals, an abomination and unclean. And the Lord is saying these are ones that are detestable. So we would first just want to ask ourselves this question. Why did the Lord forbid certain animals but allow others? Were these uh, just, uh, uh, were they just arbitrary? The first question would be, are they just arbitrary laws? Like the Lord just, was it just a test of religious devotion to the people? Uh, you can have, uh, you can, uh, you know, wear the color blue but not red. No, it wasn't just, it wasn't just some sort of arbitrary uh, choice, and it wasn't just a test of religious devotion. Then God has had a specific plan. We could then ask, was it, was it primarily for hygiene, and was it for health? Does the Lord conclude the passage by saying, you shall be healthy for I am healthy? No, he doesn't. He says, you shall be holy, for I am holy. However, in God's sovereign design, he did keep them from eating the less healthy animals to be sure, okay? So it wasn't just about hygiene, but the Lord had a selective purpose in why he chose the animals that he chose and why he forbade the animals that he forbade. But ultimately, we would say that it's a theological typology that the Lord is presenting to his people. And that is one of separation. That there would be a distinction between his people and the people of the world, the pagan peoples of the world. Many of them who would, would devour food with the blood still in it, uh, even in some of their pagan practices, some of these, these animals were, were uh, celebrated and, and pagan uh, false, you know, or idolatrous uh, worship rites and, and such. We also realize that many of these animals are unhealthy. They're the scavengers of, of the earth, uh, prone to carry disease. Uh, those that would eat these animals would, uh, would uh, expect shorter lifespans, uh, unhealthier living during the time. And so what the Lord was doing was preserving for, him for himself a special people and a different people and a blessed people. And not only, not only are God's commands good, but God's commands are, are right. And so he, this was a way, but ultimately what it was, it was this theological thought of, of a way from the abominable and, and a way from the, uh, that which would defile, 
or that which would be detestable and come to me, come separate to me and be, be holy. And because of that, there was, there was also a mention of, of uh, dead animals, the handling of dead animals, both clean and, and unclean, and, uh, and how they would become ceremony, ceremonially unclean. And when we pick that, that up in verse 24, it says, But these, uh, by these you shall become unclean. Uh, whoever touches uh, the carcass of any of them shall be unclean until evening. Whoever carries part of the carcass of any of them shall wash his clothes and, and be unclean until evening. Uh, the carcass of any animal which divides the hoof uh, but is, is not cloven hoofed or does not chew the cud is unclean to you. Uh, everyone who touches it shall be unclean. So, so if they were to touch the carcass of any of these animals, uh, they would be unclean. Remember that that would uh, make them defiled and, and not allowed into the Lord, Lord's presence. In verse 27, but, and whatever goes on its paws among all kinds of animals that go on all fours, those are unclean to you. Whoever touches any carcass shall be unclean into evening. Uh, whoever carries any such carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until, until evening it is unclean to you. And he follows through with that, with that thinking um, on and, and such in verse 29. These also shall be unclean to you, uh, the creeping things. And then he mentions uh, another category, the mole, the mouse, the large lizard. Uh, essentially, all, uh, all reptiles were unclean. The gecko, the monitor lizard, uh, sorry, can't eat those. Uh, the, uh, the reptile, the sand lizard, the chameleon. Uh, these are unclean to you among all that creep. Whoever touches them, uh, when they are dead, shall be unclean until evening. Anything on which uh, any of them falls, whether they are dead or unclean, whether it is of any item of wood or clothing, skin or sack, whatever item it is in, w in which any work is done, it must be put in water, and it shall be unclean until evening, then it shall, then it shall be clean. Uh, and any earthen vessel into which any of them falls, you shall break, and whatever is in it shall be unclean, and whatever is in it shall... Uh, in verse 34, in such a vessel, any edible food uh, upon which uh, water falls uh, then becomes unclean. So if water touched the one and then touched the other, that food's unclean. And any drink that you may be drunk from it becomes unclean. Verse 35, and everything on which uh, a part of any carcass falls shall be unclean, whether it is an oven or a cooking stove, it shall be broken down for they are unclean and they shall be unclean to you. Nevertheless, a spring or a cistern in which there is plenty of water shall be clean, but, but whatever touches any such carcass shall be unclean. Um, uh, uh, it becomes unclean. And then verse 37, and if any part of any such carcass falls in any planting seed, uh, which is to be shown, it remains unclean. Uh, hang in there with me, Jason, verse 38. Uh, but if any water is put on the seed and is a part of any such carcass falls, it becomes unclean. Then verse 39, and if any animal which you may eat dies, he who touches its carcass shall be unclean until, until evening. Verse 40, he who eats of its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. And he who he who also carries its carcass shall wash his clothes and be un unclean until evening. In verse 41, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth shall be a, an abomination. It shall not be eaten. Verse 42, whatever crawls on its belly and whatever goes around on all fours and whatever has many feet among all creeping things that creep on the earth, these you shall not eat. They are an abomination. And you shall not make yourselves an abomination, abominable, abominable with any creeping thing that creeps, nor shall you make yourselves unclean with them, lest you be defiled by them. Now let's stop, stop right there, uh, because we, when we get into verse 44, there's some really important information for us, and it really applies to us today. Let me just sum up a few things that we read. Not only did we get another list of animals that were unclean, but we also realized that if anybody was carrying a, one of these unclean or even clean animals dead in their pouch, uh, that they would be unclean. The penalty for being unclean was what? Did you pick, pick it up? It was simply to wash your clothes and be unclean until evening. So it was a relatively small consequence for touching a dead animal. In fact, oftentimes you would need to touch a, a dead animal. Now, the priests were not unclean when they would kill an animal in the ceremonial rites. Uh, but otherwise, it was just a cleansing, um, and then you were 
uh, and then you were clean. You'd wash your clothes. You'd be clean at evening. And interesting enough, there is no punishment or consequence mentioned for eating any of the unclean animals. It did not say that uh, they'd be cut off from their people or they would have to go through anything. It would just simply said that they that they uh, uh, that these were abominable things and that they shouldn't they shouldn't eat them. But when we come now to verse 44, we find the Lord's heart. Especially if we keep in mind this idea of unclean and abominable, uh, we consider it detestable, defilement, and those things that would separate. And so the children of Israel lived for 1,500 years under these dietary laws. And of course, Jews, Orthodox Jews today, still live under them. And even many Messianic Jews, uh, born Jews, still uh, worship according to the dietary laws. But we'd have to recognize this, that, that for their existence, especially in the Old Testament times, the Lord said, stay away from these. And he gives the reason in verse 44. For I am the Lord your God, you shall therefore consecrate or set yourselves apart, sanctify yourselves, and you shall be holy, he says, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth, for I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And so the Lord gives the reasoning why, and, he, and ultimately the reason why is that he is a holy God and he's purchased them to be his people. And so he wants them to look differently than the nations around and that they would be holy as he was holy. Now we have to realize this one thing about the Jews. They didn't have, they didn't have these compartmentalized lives like many of us as Americans have. They didn't have secular and religious. Their lives were lived out in a state of worship, or at least it should be. Everything from the clothes that they wore, not mixing various kinds of garments, to the tassels that would hang daily, to the, their beards, to the way they wore them, and not trimming their, their sides of their, their face, to, uh, or the, trimming their beards, to, to the food that they ate, that they would consider that their lives were acted out in worship. And when, when Moses would give the repetition of the law after the desert years, the book is called Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law. Deuteronomy literally means the second law. Moses would sum this up by saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And in, in essence, the Lord was saying, I just yanked you out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of slavery, and everything's going to look different about your life. You are going to be completely different than the nations around you. From the food that you eat to the, way, to the way that you keep your camp clean, to the clothes that you wear, to the God that you worship, to the sacrifices that you offer, to the way you teach, treat your children, to the way you take a, a Sabbath day's rest, you are going to be different. You're going to stay away from those things that are detestable and that would defile you and that would make you look just like the rest of the scavengers in the world and the pagans. And, that's, and that was the, the Lord's heart behind the dietary laws. Now, part of the dietary laws, as we just saw, was what happens if you have something unclean that touches a bowl? What happens to that bowl? It becomes unclean. Or if you have unclean meat, touch a cooking stove. The stove becomes unclean. You have to break it down. Part of this makes me think like, hey, you know what? I mean, if you want to eat according to the dietary laws, maybe somebody wants to eat according to the dietary laws today. If they put their meat down on a conveyor belt uh, at the grocery store, guess what? If somebody put pork on that, it's unclean. And that, that food cannot be eaten. And so if you really, and that's why Paul said, you want to eat according to the laws, hey, let's think about the, 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 the stringency of, of the law and what it's really saying. And so there's really no fulfilling the Old Testament law. However, what we find is that the Lord it does have a desire that we, we worship him and we honor him. It was very easy for the Jews to, uh, it was very easy for the Jews to make everything um, it, it, in, an, in an external 
to take everything in an external extreme. And so if you remember in Matthew chapter 15, there was a passage where uh, the uh, Pharisees were uh, coming against Jesus because his disciples ate with unwashed hands. And, uh, and, and, and it's not that they're eating with dirty hands, but just that they were not washing their hands in a certain ceremonial manner. And they said, why do your disciples eat with unwashed hands? And Jesus simply said to them, uh, he said, well, he said, well, why do you transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your own tradition? And then he pointed out uh, a certain false practice that they had uh, when they had uh, essentially said all that they had received was a gift from God. They said it was Corbin. Because of that, they couldn't help out their aging parents because they were priests and scribes that any gift, any financial uh, financial uh, gain that they received from the ministry provision was essentially God's gift to them as a priest and it they would consider it improper to help out their aging parents with that. And Jesus said, you're, you're transgressing the fifth command for the sake of your, tra for the sake of your tradition. And then, uh, then he said, these people draw near to me with their hearts, uh, with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And he says, and to eat with unwashed hands, defiled, not a man. And then the, the disciples asked him the question. And they said, what, what do you mean? To, and, and Jesus says, and it was, it's Matthew 15, 11. He says, it's not what goes into a man uh, that defiles him, but it's what comes out of his mouth that defiles him. And, and then later on in verses 18 and 19, uh, there he says, but those things which proceed out of the mouth of man, these are what defiles him. And for out of the, the heart of man proceeds murders, thefts, adulteries, fornications, covetousness. That's what's in the heart of man. And so the Jews took it to an external extreme. As long as I'm eating the right food, as long as I'm washing the pitchers in the right way. And Jesus said, no, it's what's in your heart. You know what? There's actually a commentary in Mark's gospel about this very, about this very comment that Jesus made in Mark 7, 11. And it was after Jesus made the statement, it's not, it's, uh, it's, it's because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach and it's eliminated. And then it says, thus purifying all foods. And it was just a recognition that, that in the New Testament, Jesus even purified all foods there. And then of course, we just went through the book of Acts when we read that uh, the Lord gave that vision to Peter, rise Peter, kill and eat. And even the Lord commanded Peter to eat these unclean foods. And, and we would recognize that we're not under the dietary laws. They're not repeated in the New Testament. Uh, even Romans 14, Paul talks very explicitly about it. He said, if you want to eat according to the dietary laws and you don't, um, and so if you want to not eat, then you can not eat and give God thanks. But if you want to eat, then you can eat and give God thanks. But each one can be fully convinced in his own mind. It's not about the food and what the Lord says. But it is about our hearts. And it is about having lives that are set apart to the Lord, that are not defiled. And we are to love the Lord, as Jesus said, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that we should live different lives than the world around. And, and what, we, what we view, what we allow into the eye gate, into the ear gate, uh, the words that we allow to come out of our mouth, the things that we meditate upon. And the Lord has shed his blood and to make us clean, to make us holy. Uh, we, we read in 1 Peter 1, uh, 15 and 16, uh, certainly uh, a message to the New Testament church. Uh, certainly we are still called by a holy God to be a holy people. Uh, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. We serve a holy God, church. And, and the verse that precedes this says that we're to rest our, great, our hope fully upon the grace of God that will be brought to us at his revelation. Yes, God has been gracious to us through his son. He died on a cross and rose again to forgive all our sin. But he's just like the children of Israel were saved out of slavery. And he's like, I just rescued you from Egypt out of bondage so that you would be mine and you'd be holy. The Lord says, I saved you from that sin. I rescued you out of it so that you would be mine and that you would be holy. 
And, and notice there in verse First uh, Peter 1, 16, that you'd be holy in all your conduct. You know what we find uh, in the New Testament, Paul giving attention to diet, not so much to the Jewish dietary laws, but just to be careful not to eat food sacrificed to idols because he didn't want to cause anybody to stumble. And even concludes that one of those passages when he's discussing that in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, a familiar verse where he says, therefore, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, you know, or uh, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Let there be no division between my secular life and my religious life. That all that I do, the food that I eat, the, the clothes that I wear, the way that I conduct myself, the conversation that I have, that I would say, Lord, my life is yours, and I want to honor you and glorify you with it. And, and we know that that is the Lord's, the Lord's heart for us, and he's redeemed us. Uh, he is a holy God, and he calls us to be a holy people. Now, verse 46 of Leviticus 11, as we conclude that chapter, it says, uh, this is the law of the animals and the birds and every living creature that moves in the waters and every creature that creeps on the earth to distinguish between unclean and clean and between the animal that may be eaten and the animal that may not be eaten. The Lord's desire was that they would be able to distinguish. You know that? Notice that in verse 47. That means that they would be able to discern or test between what was right and what was wrong. Uh, faith is a great measure for us. Romans 14 tells us whatever's not from faith is sin. And that means, can you do what you're doing with a clean conscience before the Lord? Uh, here's a test that I've used through the years. Can I show up to church and say what I have done for entertainment from the pulpit as an analogy in, in a sermon? And if what I did for entertainment was hike up a hill or play Monopoly with, with my kiddos, uh, I certainly can. If it's watching this or if it's watching that and I would, I would feel a tinge of, of like, ah, oh, I don't want to tell you what I've been doing, then do I, has I, have I really acted in faith? Has my life been a holy life? Has it been conducted before the Lord with gladness and praise unto Him? Could I say, Lord, I just praise you for that time doing this. You know, and if it's, again, playing a board game with the kids or playing basketball with my son, I could get done with that and say, Lord, I just thank you for that time. It was a wonderful time. Well, we had a blessed time doing that. Yeah, it's a secular event, possibly. But, but it's my life is I'm, recognition, I'm recognizing that that thing that I did didn't defile me. It wasn't an abominable thing. It, it wasn't a detestable thing. It didn't grieve my conscience afterward. And, and I was able to do it with joy as, an un, as unto the Lord. And um, I can eat bacon and say, praise the Lord. We had a wonderful breakfast and a wonderful meal. But there are other things in my life that, that I think about or that reside in my heart. Hey, what you're thinking about, I care not to tell you right now <laughs> because I can't praise the Lord. And so, we, so I say, Lord, make me holy and I want to be holy and I want to be yours. And uh, in conclusion and to set up uh, the communion table for us, church, let's look at chapter 12. It's a short chapter uh, and it's just eight verses. Uh, but here we find in uh, chapter 12, the ritual after childbirth. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel. If a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As in the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean uh, because of the flow of blood. Uh, and so some of this will make more sense throughout our study of Leviticus and the sanctity the Lord puts on blood. Uh, and and uh, but she would be unclean. Then a verse. So one week for for a uh, for a male child. Then verse four. Then she shall continue in the blood of her uh, purification for thirty three days. I jumped over verse three. Uh, and on the eighth day of the the flesh of uh, his foreskin shall be circumcised. Interestingly, uh, the 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 human body. Uh, produces vitamin K starting after about a week or so, uh, when, and that's the, the vitamin that helps your blood clot. And so the Lord says, wait for eight days before you circumcise your boy. How did the Lord know that the body wouldn't clot, the, help blood to clot for eight days? 
uh, ver verse 4, uh, shall, she shall then continue in the blood of her purification for 33 days. Uh, she shall not touch any hallowed thing, uh, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purification are fulfilled. So it would be about 40 days before she could go to the house in the, of the Lord and worship. It would be one week and then 33 days after. But if it was a female child, uh, then she'd be unclean two weeks as in her customary impurity, and then she would continue in the blood of her, her purification 66 days. And so why uh, it was twice as long, 80 days for a female child rather than 40, 40 days, um, uh, is, I don't think the Lord just put this in here for the battle of the sexes. So like guys, we have what, like one more up on the gals or like, hey, only 40 days for you, 80 days for us. It could be for the fact that uh, the women uh, later on would uh, also have a flow of blood and that customary impurity. Uh, the, Lord, the Lord knows why the distinction uh, be, between the two. Uh, verse 6, but when the days of her purification are fulfilled, uh, whether a son or for a daughter, uh, she shall bring to the priest uh, a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering and a young pigeon uh, or a turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. Interesting. The sin offering for atonement. Uh, for her flow of blood. Not that, of course, sh childbearing was wrong in any way. It was God's command, be fruitful and multiply. Children are a blessing and a heritage from the Lord, thus the burnt offering. But the sin offering would be simply a recognition, not only of the blood that was shed, but, uh, but that the fact that a sinner was born into the world. It was a solid Old Testament theological uh, uh, argument uh, and, and a piece of information that saints of old knew. David said, in sin, my mother conceived me. Not that his mom had an adulterous relationship to conceive him, but he knew that when he came in the world, he was a sinner. And, um, and from the first sin, it was this idea that every child that was born was indeed a sinner. So a sin offering was, was offered, not that, of course, uh, procreation is any, by any way sin. It's God's blessing. Children are not sin, but children are sinners. <laughs> and so there's a burnt offering, one, to say, just like we do a child dedication, a burnt offering, say, this child is now given to you all the days of his life. Uh, and the burnt offering, uh, as a instead of offering the child and then the sin offering that a sinner has been brought into the world. And so there was two animals that were offered. But then notice in verse 8, and if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves and two young pigeons. One is a burnt offering and the other is a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for her and she will be clean. And then the word clean is opposite of the word unclean before. And this means accepted, draw, brought near, holy, esteemed, and glorious. So the woman, after her, the days of customary impurity, would bring a ram for a burnt offering and a turtle dove for a sin offering. If she was poor, what would she bring? Two turtle doves instead of the ram. And then she'd be accepted. Now, this has a beautiful fulfillment in Jesus. Because when Jesus was born, it, he was circumcised on the eighth day. 33 days after that, on the 40th day, he was brought to the temple. And what did his parents offer? Luke 22, verses 22 through 24, it, it, it tells us, uh, now when the days of our purification according to the law of Moses were completed, uh, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And uh, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called to the Lord. So they bring him. What did they offer? Luke 2, 24. To offer the sacrifice of what was according to the Lord, and then it was a pair of turtle doves, two young pigeons. Isn't that interesting? Mary and Joseph were poor. They brought the poor person's offering. And the Lord, but why, why the two turtle doves? Remember? One was for a sin offering, and a sin offering because a sinner was born into the world. But Jesus was no sinner. But Jesus was no sinner. He did not have a human father, and that that you could say that second turtle dove died innocently, as a, the, a wonderful foreshadowing of how Jesus would, as a sinless man, pour out his life for us as sinners. And it was after that offering, what, what does the book of Leviticus uh, just say here in 12 verse eight at the end? And she shall be clean. Not unclean, not defiled, not separated from the Lord's presence, 
but clean, accepted, whole, and undefiled, able to come and worship ceremonially. And I just love how it, the Old Testament points us to Jesus. And it reminds us that although he was rich, for our sake, he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might become rich. And not only to become poor, leaving the glories of heaven, but he became poor by literally becoming a poor man here on earth, born into a poor family in a poor town of Nazareth, to be tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin, and then to die for our sin, rise again to give life so that we would be accepted. You know what? He has made us holy. Uh, we've been made holy by him. And now he's called us to walk in a holy, holy way with him. So let's bring the worship team up. And as we, as we come to the communion table now, uh, we're just going to finish with some worship. And any time as we, as we finish now, I just want to invite you to come up and take the bread and the cup and go back to your chair. And, and just personally, any time over these last couple of songs, just thank the Lord that his body was broken for you. Now, these are oyster crackers that we have, and they're not the broken up matzahs. And I like the broken up matzahs one because they're discolored, they're broken, they're jagged, and it reminds me of the Lord's uh, broken body. Uh, but um, you get an oyster cracker, it's perfectly six-sided. Um, so this is what I do with my oyster crackers. I break it. So I invite you to break your bread and just be reminded that the Lord's body was broken for you and, um, and that his blood was shed to give you life. And, and that's what sets you apart. It's also a time here uh, where the scripture says, let a man examine himself and let him take of the cup. And if there is something that's unholy in your life, uh, unholy practice, unholy thinking, uh, unholy living, unholy speech, uh, this, this is the time to confess it and ask the Lord to forgive you. And, I, and, and he will cleanse you. He's faithful and just to do that. And it's also a time for us just to, again, say, Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. It's, it's not the, the food that we eat, but it's what comes out of our hearts. And so let's, let's come corporately to Jesus and ask him to cleanse our hearts and have his way in our lives. Father, thank you for this evening and uh, for this text of Scripture. We pray now as we come to the communion table that you might draw us near. Cleanse our sin. We confess our sin and ask you to cleanse it. And Lord, cleanse us. Cleanse our hearts. Renew the joy of our salvation. And lead us on in right thinking, and right speaking, and right living before you. Uh, that we look different than the world around us. Because you're a holy God. We want to be a holy people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.